some of you are old enough to remember a chorus that we used to sing. Here's my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me until I want no more. Here's my cup, fill it up and make me whole. And I saw during worship all of us standing and we were all holding cups up. And, uh, and then I saw that God was filling those cups with different things. Everybody wasn't getting the same thing in their cup. Some of the cups were being filled with oil. Some were being filled with new wine. Some were being filled with living waters and waters of refreshing. And so uh, I just feel like we, I wanted us to act that out. I want us all to stand right now. And uh, uh, you know, the Bible says that, that uh, times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. And I just sense that God wants to refresh us all, and every one of us. Right now we're moving into times where we need to be full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so if you'll just, however you want to do it, just hold your cup. Amen. What color is your cup? Is it silver or gold? I don't know. What, is it ceramic? I don't know. But I want you to lift your cup up to the Lord. And now Lord, we just do this as a prophetic act. We lift our cups up to you. Yes. And we thank you for refreshing. Lord, I pray those that need oil, give them oil. Those that need new wine, come on, <laughs> some joy, <laughs> give them that. And those that need the waters of life, living waters, Lord, I just pray that we release that right now. By faith, we receive, Lord, what we need in our cup. Lord, we just as the song said, here's my cup, Lord, I lift it up. Come and quench the thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me until I want no more. Here's my cup, Lord. Fill it up and make me whole. Come on. Make me whole, Lord. Make me whole, I pray in Jesus' name. Come on, now just receive your whatever you need. It's coming right now. Father, I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of you are getting the wine. Some of you are getting the oil. Some of you are getting the waters of refreshing, the waters of life, whatever it is. God says, I am who I am. I am what you need when you need me to be that. So, Father, we thank you for it right now. We receive from you. We receive from you. Lord, our offering of praise has gone up. And, Lord, your word says, there shall be showers of blessings. Hallelujah. We thank you for the showers of blessings right now in Jesus' name. Yeah, wait a minute. I think God wants to put some blessings in somebody's cup today. Some blessings, some unmerited favor, some unmerited favors, unearned, undeserved, but he just loves you so much, he's just going to put a blessing in your cup. Come on, in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray like David. Lord, Lord, I thank you that you anoint my head with oil and my, come on, my cup runneth over. Come on, we want more than just for us. We want some for somebody else. Amen. All right. Once you get your cup filled up, you can sit down. Mark, I'm going to ask you to, can you pull up my my uh, YouTube channel just for fun? Is that possible? It's under my name. All right. Well, before we uh, get into what we're going to get into today, I'm going to lower this a little bit more. There we go. Um, I want to just introduce my wife, Pam, uh, and stand up, Pam. Uh, you, know, you, guys, you guys should have her come and speak. She's got an incredible message on restoring your soul, and uh, it's worth hearing. And just out of her own life experience, and uh, we've been married for over 50 years now, and we never have fought ever. Uh, no, just on the way here today. I mean, I, I was that was the first time ever. No, we don't fight. But um, yeah, and so uh, she's an amazing woman of faith, and uh, just you know, always has just been the best partner anyone could ever have. I prayed for you know. God says, "I'll do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or even think." Well, I prayed and prayed and prayed after I first got saved. 
And that was my number one prayer request is, God, I need a wife. <laughs> and, uh, and so I prayed and prayed. In fact, when I found out that God answers prayer when I first got saved, I, I went to everybody that I knew that believed that God answered prayer. I said, you got, are you praying? I haven't got my wife yet. Where is she? You know, you got to be praying. And so the Lord that did exceedingly abundantly above, above all we can ask or even think by giving me Pam <coughs> and um, appreciate her. We have uh, four daughters and um, uh, our girls are all amazing. We got some grandkids and uh, we got some young ones and some that are in college and uh, they're fun anyhow. All right. Um, so. I did, were you able to find my... Yeah, I did. Okay, can you put it on the screen? Mark can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. The only reason I'm doing it is not trying to push anything or sell anything here. Although if you click anything on it, it will take money right out of your account and put it in your <laughs> account. No, not really. Um, I'm starting a, a series of messages. There we go. And so I have a YouTube channel. <coughs> and. Uh, I try to, basically it's filled, I, st I was challenged by Julie Meyer, some of you may know who Julie Meyer is, mm -hmm. uh, but she challenged me uh, when, the, when we started going to lockdown last year, she said, Pastor Fred, you need to start doing you know, live streams on, on Facebook and do all that, and so I just felt like, oh, okay, and I felt that God wanted me to do basic teachings that will help people to know how to walk out the Christian life, so I'm very practical and how I teach, uh, it, it, I, I don't want to just give you theology or just here's these experiences, but I want you to know how to be equipped. But the Bible says that we're supposed to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And so uh, the reason I'm putting it up is I'm starting a series right now called How to Be Ready for the Days Ahead. <coughs> and, uh, and actually what I'm going to share with you is not on there yet, but will be one of the messages on there. <clears throat> that you can uh, re-watch and um, all the messages are about 30-35 minutes long and so I'd encourage you and I just finished just did a short series on fasting uh, I forget what I did before that but anyhow so I try to do them in series uh, kind of building line upon line and I encourage you if you it's there uh, available to you just to go there and you can go I think there's about 70 teachings on there at this point in time uh, I do two a week. I load. I usually load up two a week uh, because I'm teaching through the healing rooms twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursday nights. Amen. All right. Well, uh, today I want to. I just felt like uh, that what God had for me to share with you <clears throat> is to talk about living your life from an eternal perspective. Mm -hmm. Good topic. And um, uh, you know, I. Um, how many of you think that the Apostle Paul was a pretty amazing guy? You know, when you read, when you read what he goes through in his life, you know, I was beaten five times, and then I was, you know, with whips, and then I was, you know, I mean, I would have liked, after what, I, I've had enough. <laughs> five times, then another four times with rods, then I was stoned, not on drugs, I was stoned, you know, <laughs> actually in any case it looks like he was stoned to death if you look in Acts, that he died, he got up, you know, and then it says he got up and he went and encouraged the church, I'm like, what? <laughs> I was in the sea a day, and a, you know, three, three days and three nights, you know, and uh, you know, I was in, he says I was in danger in the city, I was in danger in the country, I was in danger by my fellow, you know, Jews, I was in danger by, in danger by wild animals, I mean, you know, I'm yeah. thinking, what? Yeah. What? Yeah. You know, we get a, a you know, an out ingrown toenail, like, oh, Jesus, I don't know if I can handle this, you know. <laughs> Help me, Jesus, I'm suffering. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And, uh, and so, you know, really, uh, we're, uh, in America, you know, I've, I've ministered in, or been traveled and ministered in uh, 41 different nations. And I've been in some, some of the nations I've been in uh, are very persecuted nations. And when I go there, you know what I feel? I feel like I'm a spiritual wimp. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have lived in a bubble here in America. Yeah. 
But I think that's all fixing, as they say in Texas, fixing to change. I think, uh, yes, I believe the glory of the Lord is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Yes, I believe there's going to be a great move of God and multitudes are going to come into the kingdom of God. But the Bible says in Isaiah 60, Arise and shine for your light has come because the glory of the Lord has appeared upon you. And it says, gross darkness has covered the earth, and gross darkness the faces of the people. Light will shine on you, but darkness will be on them. And so we're moving into, right now, here in America, into the great and terrible day of the Lord. And, uh, and I don't know how much we can prepare, but I want to do whatever. I, part of what I feel like I'm called, I was a pastor for... Uh, 32 years, been in, in ministry for uh, my, Pam and I for over 40 years, and, and I really feel like uh, I'm challenged by Matthew 24, where uh, Jesus says this. He's talking about the end times, right? They said, "When they asked him, when will these things happen?" And he talks about earthquakes, you know, famines, pestilences, wars, rumors, all that stuff. But then, if you go farther into Matthew 24, he says. That you know those that you are. If you're a scribe in the kingdom, or you're a teacher, you need to be feeding the people the right food at the right time. That's a challenge to me. I, you know, it's not so much I want to come and impress you with some message, or you know, wow, that was a hot one, you know, or whatever. In fact, I changed my mind. You know, I, in years and years, I've you know go after preaching a message, walk out to the door to greet people uh, going out of the church. And they pat me on the back and say, that was a great message. And then I realized there's something wrong with that. <coughs> and said they should be coming out saying, God was in this place. There you go. Come on. And my life was changed. Wow. You know, thank God for a pat on the back. But that's, you know, it's about what it says. It says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter um, uh, 12, I think 12, 13. 14, chapter 14, and talks about that the unbelievers will come into the congregation and fall on their face and say, God is in this place. Wow. And so, again, my heart is uh, to help feed the people the right food at the right time. Well, I think, and I, went, I don't know, how many of you got saved during the Jesus People Movement? Anybody here? All right, just a couple of us here. Okay, I got saved during the Jesus people. I were kind of a Jesus people for a while. I was a little old for the Jesus people, but I hung out with them anyhow. And when we got saved, um, it was right when, when Hal Lindsey wrote the book, Late Great Planet Earth. Okay, now for those of you who have never read that book, it was a... It was a detailed, this is how it's all going to play out. And it's probably going to play out before 1980. I mean, it's all going to play out. In fact, how many remember uh, 88 reasons why Jesus is coming in 1988? Okay, I was in Kansas City for that one. And uh, well, it was that far. Literally, there was a church in Kansas City that, was, that had given, that the man was from other Texas or someplace that came up with this thing. Jesus, you know, Jesus is absolutely coming back in 1988. And uh, there's a church in Kansas City, I won't tell you what brand, but it was a large church. And they gave their t radio show over to this guy, and they just promoted it. People started putting their animals to death. I think it was a specific death date, uh, because they believed they were going to be raptured. You know, this was going to be the end and all that. And they ran up their credit cards, and they did all kinds of dumb stuff. The problem is, Jesus didn't come back in 1988. <laughs> And so when I was first saved, um, we just, you know, we, we, I'm, we're born into, it's all about the end times. And, and that had good sides and bad time sides to it, okay? Um, good, you know, good sides, sides, uh, side of that is that we were evangelistic. I mean, if Jesus is coming back in any moment, we better be sharing Jesus with people, right? Bad side of it is we checked out. And we didn't, like, well, I don't need to go to college. I don't need to do anything because, you know, we're going to be out of here anyhow and all that. That was a big mistake. Mm -hmm. And so, so that, back in 1970, I remember feeling like we're going to be raptured at any moment. And I remember when I was, I was in construction at that time down in San Jose. And uh, I, uh, and there was a porta potty there. I think I told you this story last time about porta potty evangelism. 
<laughs> Anyhow, uh, it's where you take a black marker and you go in there and you write the gospel off the walls. <laughs> so, and there was, a, there was somebody going in and they would cry as my, cross my, my praise the Lord out and they would be up your nose with a rubber hose buddy and they'd use a different kind of language. And, and I remember getting to that porta potty and I could feel it lifting off the ground. I'm like, this is it! We're going! <laughs> And so we had this, this <laughs> driven sense that, that Jesus was about to come at any time. Now that was 1970, right? Yeah. This is 2021. How many? That's 41, 51 years ago. Well, can I just tell you there are a whole lot more signs now than there ever were then. Yeah. That, that things that we're kind of playing out the, the end here. And uh, I don't, you know, somebody said, well, yeah, you know, I don't know, you know, it could be, you know, it, it, it might be the end times, you know, way out there or whatever. But listen, for you and I, this is our last days. Yeah. I don't get to live any, you know. Yeah. For us, it's our last days. And you know, the first century church lived as if Jesus was coming back at any moment. Amen. Right? Just look at First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians. Uh, you know, Paul's telling people, Paul goes as far as saying, in lieu of what's going on, I don't even think you should think about getting married right now. So they were in this tension, which I think that we uh, lost uh, somewhere along the way here. And I think part of it, and well, part of being um, uh, ready for the end times, I believe, and again, back to, back to Paul, is that why did Paul do all that? Why did he go through all that? I know he loved Jesus. I know he had been delivered and so on. What I believe is that he lived his life from an eternal perspective instead of an earthly perspective. And um, uh, there, was a, there was a man uh, many years ago, uh, all, I forget his name, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes. Yeah, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., not Jr. He was a poet. And he made the statement, you're so heavenly minded, you're of no earthly good. Now, <clears throat> People thought that that's like almost like a scripture or something. You're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. And what he was referring to is that he looked at people in church, and all that all they cared about was what was happening on the inside of the church, and not caring about what was going on in the world around them. And that's why he made that statement. But we took it like it was the gospel or something, and uh, and so what's happened, in my opinion, we kind of switched over. Uh, during the last 50 years where we're so concerned about the here and now. What's in it for me? What's going on for me? Am I blessed? You know, am I happy? Am I fulfilled? Am I this? You know, and God wants to do all that. But what happens is that we, we shifted from a God-centered, Christ-centered gospel to a me-centered gospel. It's all about me. What's in it for me? Obviously, Paul wasn't asking what's in it for me. Yeah. He's like, I know what's in it for me. <laughs> right? And so, so we see Paul living his life from a different perspective. And I believe, uh, you know, this, this, one, of the, one of the things I try to camp out on is Revelations chapter 2 and 3, the seven times uh, Jesus says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto the church. We need to hear what is the Holy Spirit saying right now. I'll tell you what I think he's saying. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. <clears throat> I think he's saying, I believe he's saying we need to shift from an earthly mindset to a heavenly mindset. Okay? And maybe you guys got that all figured out, but I'm still working on it. Uh, but let me, I, I, was, I don't know if I'm going to get through all this, and that was all just introduction. Philippians chapter 3, <laughs> verses 12 through 15. Here's the Apostle Paul. He says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess the, that perfection for which Jesus Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Look at this next phrase. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. Notice the next phrase. Let all you who are spiritually mature 
agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. So he's, he's talking about how to live as a mature Christian. A mature Christian is living for heavenly reward, right? Now, now there, God does give us earthly rewards too. I'm not negating that. Obviously, that's true uh, and, and so on. But if we get hung up on that, then what happens is I think we become dull to the fact my neighbor is going to hell. Yeah. You know, my neighbor... My neighbor doesn't have, you know, I look at my neighbor, well, they got, you know, two boats and a nice swimming pool. No, mind, I'm just saying, making this up. But anyhow, they, you know, and they, they got, their kids seem to be happy. They got lots of money. Uh, they're not going hungry. They're, they're doing good. They don't have COVID. They're doing good. Well, I guess they're good. They're great. Yeah, minus the fact that when they die, they're going to go to hell. Forever. And so when we, so I believe God is shifting the church from being earthly minded to being heavenly minded. And that changes everything yes. and how you look at things. Now, uh, my message here is called uh, Living from an Eternal Perspective. So let me see here. Before we go to that next slide, uh, Mark, uh, let me ask you a question, okay? Uh, what, what is perspective? Anybody want to just throw out some Thoughts. What's perspective? Viewpoint. Viewpoint, yes. The way you think about things. It's the way you think about things. Interpretation. I can hear you. Interpretation. Right. Interp how you interpret things, yeah. How you frame things. How you frame things. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. The position from which you see. The position from which you see, beautiful. Right. Okay, so perspective. Let me just throw out a definition. You already say it at all. Perspective. How something is viewed. The angle uh, which something is seen. A mindset toward life. How you visualize life. People, circumstances, ideologies, your purpose, yourself, and the way you view the world. Your perspective is the lens through which you view life. And so, where are we living our life? What's the perspective? And I believe that God wants us to live from a heavenly perspective, from an eternal perspective. Uh, how you see your life uh, determines everything about your life. It, your purpose, your destiny, your values, your convictions, your decisions, your financial goals, your schedule, your time, your relationships, your uh, who you relate to, your direction, your plans, your passions, your motivations, your willingness to sacrifice. I think, see, I think this is a big thing. You know, what are we willing to sacrifice? It can't be hard to get people to show up for church on Sunday. Hello? Then you call a fast, and nobody's at church after that. <laughs> and, 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 well, you know, pray? Oh, yeah, you, you know. Spend time in the Word? Well, you know, I'm kind of busy. And so, when, but when you live your life from an eternal perspective, knowing that there are eternal rewards, right, then you live differently. Um, you, the way you see other people is different, like I've already kind of mentioned, okay? My neighbor is not rich or poor, red or yellow, black or white. They're going to heaven or they're going to hell. That's my neighbor. And I have a responsibility toward them. And uh, it, it's also, it's, it, how, how you see your life uh, it affects uh, your current, how you react to current issues and problems. So evidently, you know, here's Paul, Philippians, rejoice! <laughs> like, he's in prison, by the way, writing this. <laughs> it's, it's great when we get in a bunch of room with a bunch of people praising God, and we got the freedom, hallelujah, praise God, but sitting in a dark prison, you know, being fed on bread and water or whatever they did there, and he's like, he's writing a letter to encourage the church. Right. Rejoice! Oh, again, let me tell you again. Rejoice! Yeah. Yeah. Let your forbearing spirit be made known to all men. And so, how could he do that? He did it because he was living from an eternal perspective. From a heavenly perspective. So, I'm kind of already into it. There are two major perspectives for believers today in our world. One is obviously a temporal 
perspective. That's the next slide I think you got there. Uh, and one is eternal perspective and the other is a temporal perspective. So I just want to highlight very quickly here uh, a temporal or earthly perspective. A temporal perspective is when you look at your life from the temporary or a in time perspective. In other words, in this 70, 80 years that we live in. It's viewing your life from an earthly or worldly perspective. It's basing your life on this lifespan that you have in this world. And you're asking questions like, what's in it for me? Or what can I gain or lose in this life? It's thinking, he who ends up with the most toys wins. <coughs> a temporal perspective uh, pers uh, values things on this earth above eternal things. And so the problem when we begin to function from a temporal, is this too intense for today? No. I'm sorry, they are all looking at me like, Ugh. Uh, The problem with it is that, I'm just, we'll just put it on the screen, it's a hopeless existence. For, the, for unbelievers, uh, well, for Paul writes, and for believers, and he says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 16, and up through 19, he says, For the... If the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, and you are still in your sins. Then, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if we have hoped in Christ, in, 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 he says, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men to be pitied. Wow. In other words, if you view your life from just this life, then, you know, guess what? <laughs> it may not look that great. Uh, number two, it's, it's an empty existence. And uh, in other words, uh, the smartest man besides Jesus ever to live on earth was Solomon. How many of you have ever heard of Solomon? Okay. And he writes a book called Ecclesiastes. And Ecclesiastes is all about him trying to find everything he could do on this earth. You know, I didn't hold back myself from any pleasure. I built, I built all these great things. I, um, you know, I tried wine and I tried all kinds of things. I got, you know, obviously he was into women. He had 700 wives. I don't know why he did that. No wonder he wanted to die and go to heaven. I mean, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine, you know, 700 to-do lists? I mean, it's like... No wonder he was so busy, right? But he, the book of Ecclesiastes is him saying, if I, I've done everything that I'm, you talk about, be smart, you know, talk about all this stuff, I've done everything you can, and then he ends up by saying, it's all empty. It's all futility. It's all um, uh, grasping after wind. So what is, what is Solomon saying? When you live in this life, in this life itself alone, there is no ultimate fulfillment. So if you're looking for fulfillment in this life, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Apart from God, we're not going to have fulfillment. And even, okay, can you be fulfilled in this life? Yes, in Jesus, in Christ. And so then he even goes so far and Ecclesiastes 3.19, he says, whatever happens to animals is what happens to us. <laughs> There's no difference. We're not any better off than the animals. Now, he was not talking about evolution. He was just saying, you know, they die and we're going to die too. So what's the point? And then he says, and not only that, he says, I build up all this wealth, I build all, only to give it to the fool that comes after me. Wow, wow that was great. So it's an empty existence. Number three, it's a selfish existence. Remember Jesus' parable where he talked about the man who said, you know, hey, I've got all this wealth. I'm going to, you know, tear down my barns and build bigger barns. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, you know, just continue to gather up all my goods and all this stuff. And Jesus, and he said, I'll say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat and drink and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then those who uh, then, those, then whose will those things be which you have provided? So he so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And so he's talking about the you know the 
the, 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 what happens when we only live for this earth, it becomes a selfish thing. You know, I gotta you know, get mine. I gotta get, I gotta, you know, and, and we, we, you know, what, as a pastor, uh, for when I was pastoring, I early on, uh, it was during a time, I think I mentioned this last time I was here, when we were really into church growth. They were right, 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 it was called the church growth movement, and there was a lot of books about growing church, and if your church wasn't exploding with growth, then you were a failure. And so, man, my church wasn't exploding with growth. I'm a failure. And what was wrong was not, is that I had the wrong definition of success. The right definition was, am I doing what God's called me to do? Doesn't matter what the results are. See, like, well, I prayed for somebody and they didn't get healed. Doesn't matter, you did what God told you to do. God's clapping in heaven. Yay, way to go. Yeah, yeah. The results are left up to God. We just do what God's called us to do, and God calls that success. <laughs> you know, that's the whole thing with the, the talents, you know, in Matthew 20, uh, 25, which is, again, telling us how to prepare for the end times. And, you know, like one man was given five, you know, five talents, another two, another one, so on. So it's what do you do with the time that God gives you on the earth? And then God says, you are faithful. There you go. There's this definition of success. Right? One word. Faithful. You are faithful and a little thing. I'm going to make you ruler over much. Amen. And then number four, it's a wasted existence. Jesus said this in Mark 8.36. What if a man... Uh, pro what, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Mm -hmm. Wow. So, if you depend on life and this life alone, you're never going to be satisfied. Uh, there will be things in your life and other things that things in your life won't make sense. How many of you had things happen to you like, well, that doesn't make any sense? Well, in the context of your 60, 70, 80 years on this planet, it doesn't make sense. But when you put it in the context of eternity, it can make big sense. That's why James writes uh, in James chapter 1, he says, count it all joy. Yeah. What's wrong with you, James? You've lost your mind. You live with Jesus too long. <laughs> this is Jesus' little brother, right? <laughs> count it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the trying of your faith produces patience or endurance. That endurance have its perfect work, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. Well, the only way you can... You know, see that what I'm going through right now makes any sense is if you look at it by what's God doing in the midst of this? What's He trying to produce in my life? Where is He going with this? He getting me ready for the future. You know, we ask questions like, "Am I happy? Are things working the way I want? The way that I want? Never. <laughs> Do people love me? Well, yes, I can answer yes on that one. Am I a success or a failure? Or we just start, you know, if you live in this world only, you start to compare yourselves with other people. Yeah. Even in the ministry, you start to get into comparison. All right, so let's shift to eternal perspective. Eternal perspective is when you look at your life in view of the light of eternity. It's understanding that you're an eternal being. That your life is going to go on after death, and death is not the end, but a continuation of an eternal, uh, eternal existence. It's basing our life on the fact that what we do in this life has eternal ramifications, both consequences and rewards. So we can see in this level, why did, why did Paul, why was he living the way, what, you know, why was he living that way? Why was he enduring all things? Because he was looking to the reward. He was looking at that, you know, yes, I'm paying a price now. Yes, it's costing. And here's, here's, I mean, I like, it would be really wild to sit down and have a little conversation with the Apostle Paul. He's like, yeah, all these light, affix, light afflictions. I'm like, what? Oh, yeah. Light afflictions? I got a headache. I'm like, oh, Jesus, help me on. <laughs> he called everything he went through a light affliction yep. compared to the eternal weight of glory. Right that he was going to get through what he went through. Yes. Wow. I, I just think, I'm, I'm not into, like, let's preach a big message on suffering, but the American church doesn't have that word in it. Right, no, that's right, it's true. 
We think that something's wrong if I ever suffer, right. or I ever have a loss, right. or I'm ever hurting, uh, or those things. Nothing's wrong. It's the normal Christian life. Right. But the Bible says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. That's right. Well, the, what things? <laughs> well, he lists them in Romans chapter 8. And all these negative things he's talking about, right. we're still more than conquerors. So, what is living uh, from an eternal perspective? It's an existence with purpose and meaning. I, when I, as I shared last time, I think I shared a little bit about my salvation. When I got saved on the side of the mountain there in Lake Tahoe, Nevada, the first reality that came to me was that I had purpose. That I was created for purpose. And my purpose is more than this world. It's an eternal purpose. And in fact, as we give ourselves over to eternal purpose, we're going to be sharing the gospel. People are going to come to Christ. When we get to heaven, there's going to be people there thanking you for sharing Jesus with you. Yeah. Amen. You took the time to talk to me and stop and talk to me. And we're so into, we got this big word, tolerance. We need to tolerate. No, we don't. You know, we need, to, we, need to, we need to be careful. We don't want to offend anybody. Well, if you share the gospel with people, they're going to be offended. Yeah. At first, I was. You know, when someone talked, tried to talk to me about Jesus, I was offended. I get away from me. You're a religious nut. <laughs> really? But, you know, thank God. You know, I, I, I think I told you the story of Amy Piedmont, I won't go into it, but she was the, one of the first people that I remember specifically that tried to share Jesus with me. I was walking to school, uh, and it was, it was freshman in high school, I'm on my way to walk by her house. She comes out of her house at 8 o'clock in the morning, walks in the middle of the street and grabs my arm. <laughs> and I, I knew her, because I grew up with her son, and she had babysitted me when I was a baby, actually. She grabs my arm and she's trying to put some little booklet in my hand saying something about, I need God. And I shook her off and I ran down the street and I yelled back, Amy, you're a fanatic. <laughs> when I got saved, I lost all my friends when I got saved. None of my hippie friends liked what happened to me. My parents, my family, nobody would, everybody thought I was crazy and all that. I didn't know who to go to. And then I remembered Amy Piedmont. <laughs> And I went to her house. At this point, I'm, you know, hippie with buckskin clothes and all this. And uh, the only thing I had knew that was added was a big wooden cross that I had hanging around my neck. <laughs> I just, awesome. And I knocked on the door, and she came to the door, and she looked at me. And I go, hi, Amy, I'm a fanatic, too. <laughs> and that was when I was 22 years old. And uh, she took me under her wing. I go. I went over her house every day after work. I go over her house five o'clock. Sit down at her table. She'd pray for me. Wow. She'd talk to me. She'd disciple me. She just began to, you know, pour it into my life. Yes. Why did I go there? Because she she took the risk. She was willing to, you know, accept rejection to try to and to keep me from going to hell. So it's an existence with purpose and meaning. Number two, it's an existence with both eternal and temporal fulfillment and glory. Uh, here's that verse I was talking about. I think, let's, let's see here. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. It says, for our, our light affliction, is, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen. There's a clue right there. We do not look at what's going on around us, but at the things which are not seen. Excuse me. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And then remember Peter's question to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, we gave up everything. What's in it for us? Okay. Right? Good question. You know, Peter always was asking the right questions, right? No. <laughs> Anyhow, and so Jesus said to Peter and the rest, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels 
who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. There's, they put that one on your refrigerator. With persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. So there is profit, there is blessing from walking with Jesus in this life. But we need to see it from both sides, right? So that, that's true. Number three, the third thing is it's an existence culminating in eternal rewards. Lots of scriptures on that. Uh, Matthew 16, Jesus said, uh, For then the Son of Man will come in glory, uh, the glory of his Father and with the, his angels, then he will reward each one according to his works. Not what he said, what he did. Right? We don't like that part. Okay. Luke chapter 6. Blessed are you when men hate you. Get ready, get ready, get ready, folks. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you and cast you out, cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven. Wow. Wow. So we're getting set up to have some rewards. <laughs> Luke 6, 35. Love your enemies, Jesus said. Do good, land, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil, and to the evil. Number four, it's an existence resulting in eternal promotion and responsibilities. Wow. I remember... Uh, when we were in Kansas City, I, I was around Mike Bickle a lot. I don't know who Mike Bickle is. Some of you do. Okay. Anyhow, um, Mike, um, uh, he, I remember him talking about the goal of his, his goal for his, the members of his church was to have more people with the highest promotions in heaven than anybody else. <laughs> and so... Uh, you know, I already mentioned Matthew 25, well done thou good and faithful servant, you've been faithful in a few things, I will make you ruler over many things. Uh, Revelations 3.21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. Holy cow. <laughs> wow. As I overcame uh, and sat down with my father. Uh, 2 Timothy says, if we endure, you know, if we endure, we will also reign with him. Uh, number five. Now, here's how am I doing on time? I think I have two hours left, right? I'm just kidding. Okay. All right. Now, I'm going to share with you um, is number five on there? Yeah. Uh, it is an existence where we function from our third heaven position and not from our first heaven circumstances. Okay? I don't know, yeah, I mean, I'd like to take credit for this revelation, but I can't because I just got it from um, Chris Valentin from uh, up at uh, Reading. Uh, here it is. Um, the Bible says in Genesis 1-1 that in the beginning, God created the what? Heavens. Heavens, right? Plural, right? Yeah. In the beginning, God created the heavens, plural, and the earth. Uh, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, and he says, I know a man who 14 years ago, whether in body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the... Third, third heaven. What was it? Third heaven. third heaven. He was caught up to the third heaven. All right? So, if there's a third heaven, there has to be a first and second heaven. Yeah. Right? And, and so, when you live from a temporal perspective or an earthly perspective you you solve try to solve all your problems from first heaven mm -hmm. with first heaven wisdom first heaven answers and um okay then so there must be a so what 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 are the heavens so the first heaven is where we live we look up and we look into the heavens right it's the atmosphere it's the stars we can look into the heavens that's the first heaven what what is the second heaven well the third heaven let's just jump right there third heaven is where God is right so Paul was caught up to the third heaven which is where the throne of God is which is where you know the God sits in the presence of God and people that are, are standing before him right now and so on well what's the second heaven well the second heaven yeah you already got it is the 
it's the area where demo, demonic for, actually is where fallen angels function on principalities. And that's what Paul talks about, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. He says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of this darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Right? And so here's the problem. We, we, we're being attacked by second heaven issues. We're, you know, we're not wrestling against what's, what's going on in America. What is wrong with our president? What is wrong with, you know, what the, what in the world is going on here? Well, listen, they're just little puppets. That's all they are. They're being controlled by second heaven rulers, forces of wickedness in heavenly places. So then what we try to do is we're trying to win by functioning from first heaven, from earthly solutions. And uh, Chris, is, he was telling his story, uh, and it's pretty interesting. He got invited to a think tank made up of all Christians. There was about 40, 50 Christians that were like, they had, well, everybody in the room had like nine degrees and... You know, they were a doctor of everything, and they were brilliant people, and scientists, and medical, and all that. And they had a three-day think tank where they spent all day discussing how they were going to solve the problems of the world, like poverty, like human trafficking, like what, you know, they were coming up with all these things. And he was there, and, and evidently, he was up in a balcony in this meeting. So, again, I can't remember exactly how many people were there. But he's in the balcony, and he was shocked that nobody thought of any third heaven solutions to what was going on. Yeah. Wow. They were only coming up with first heaven, you know, answers. Well, if we did this, if we did this medically, if we did this scientifically, if we did this socially, if we did this, you know, then we could solve this problem. Wow. So uh, it was, I think, the second day, and I guess the, Chris said him and those that were with him decided we're out of here. <laughs> but, uh, they, they, but they opened it up and they said, would anybody like to share anything? So Chris raised his hand, and he began to explain the, the three heaven concept to them. And said, you know, it seems to me like we're trying to solve first heaven problems with first heaven solutions. He said, I, I just wonder, why haven't we talked about any third heaven? This is prayer. This is fasting. This is worship. This is, you know... This is faith, you know, we're, we're and so on. And it, it, anyhow, so he brings it up, and everybody just kind of looked at him like, what? <laughs> Why would we even think about doing that? He said the, the head guy of the whole thing, uh, after the meeting, came up to him. He says, I've never heard anything like this in my whole life. <laughs> now, talking about perspective. All right, listen to this. When Jesus died and rose again, Ephesians chapter 1, he ascended and was seated at the right hand of the Father, where? Above all rule and authority and power, both in this age and in the one to come. Ephesians chapter 2, we get born again, we are now seated with Christ in heavenly places. Now, why in the world we say we're seated with Christ in every place? Trying to say you need a perception change. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. When you come into me, you got to view life from a different perspective, yeah. and everything changes when you start looking from above instead of down here. What am I going to do with these problems? Oh God, I don't know. How am I going to make it financially? Well, there's heavenly wealth that's available to you. Now, what I'm going to say is not, I'm not against doctors. I, I, I think doctors are great. I think going, you got issues, you've got to go to the doctors. I think medicine is awesome and everything like that. But before we go there, and this, here's the thing. Let me tell the thing that Chris said I thought was really good. You remember when the, Jesus fed the 5,000, right? So he does the miracle, fish and loaves, feeds 5,000. And, uh, you know, they're gathering up the fragments, seven baskets full, all that. Then Jesus says, okay, get in the boat. We're going across the, the lake. They get in the boat, and Jesus says to them, beware of the bread, you know, the leaven. leaven of the Pharisees. And they're like, oh, my gosh, we forgot to bring bread. 
And they're all like, what are we going to do? And from walking off the shore, getting the boat, they forgot about the miracle of multiplication of fish and loaves. They had already, you know, they just saw a heavenly solution. They saw a, you know, a, a spiritual third heaven solution to a first heaven issue. And by the time they got to the boat, they had already forgot about it. What are we going to do? And so we've got to, what we've got to do is we've got to shift. You know, and if you go back to the Old Testament, there were certain kings that when they, maybe it's only one, I can't remember, that when they got sick, they, they ended up dying. It says because they sought the physicians before instead of seeking the Lord. Amen. Now, I'm not saying that you, you know, you just got to walk in. I can, I can never take an aspirin or I can never do anything like that. Be it unto you according to your faith, right? That's all. That's not a bad thing. But did we go to the Lord first? Did we, did we say, wait a minute, I'm seated far above all principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and forces of weakness that I begin. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go at this from my heavenly position. Amen. Wow. Just some thoughts. Yes. Yes. Awesome. All right, so I'm going to just end with this. <clears throat> and that is, what, are, what does it look like to live our lives from an eternal perspective? Well, number one, we look at our lives in the light of eternity. Not just the 70 or 80 years that we're here in this world. Number two, we base, now here it is, we base our values on eternal truths, not on the opinion uh, of the opinions of this world. So here it is. Um, my, my wife, Pam, she was on a panel of ladies recently. They've been doing um, these um, ladies' meetings. And what they did is they had all the ladies write out uh, prior, way before the meeting, uh, questions they had about, you know, family, about marriage, about all that. And uh, so they wrote out how many, 40 questions? I can't remember, it was about 40 questions. So Pam's reading the questions to me. And we're just like, what? <laughs> and it wasn't just that they were kind of like complex or whatever, but I'm like, oh, hey, I've got the answer. What does the Bible say? <laughs> Oh, wow, that just never occurred to me. What does the Bible say? No, there was the majority, I mean, there were some, again, there were some things that were kind of complicated and, 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 and so on. But the, the, the answer to most of the questions that they asked were simply like, well, here's what the Bible says you should do about this. Yeah. How do I get my husband to do what I want him to do? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> My answer was, tear out all the pages in the Bible that say what he should do and just read the ones that tell you what you should do. Yeah. That's terrible. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> men would be the same. You know, come on, I'm not involved in the women. The men would, would, would be just the same. So, number three, we make, our, we make choices and decisions based on e God's eternal will and not on what we think is best for us. Sometimes making a decision to go God's way is going to cost us. Right? Again, it isn't, am I happy? No. It's, am I obedient? Am I, right? Um, number four, uh, we are willing to lay down our lives for the sake of God's kingdom and eternal purposes. How many of you know who Robbie Dawkins is? Anybody know? There's a couple people. Okay. Robbie Dawkins, I got to meet him one time, and uh, he does, most of his ministry is done in Afghanistan, Pakistan, in, wow. in those nations, and he's in, he's in Pakistan right now. So he evidently he was in <coughs> Afghanistan when this whole debacle took place, and he went off into Pakistan just for safety, obviously. So he went off there, and he did a video, I don't know if you saw that video, but he did a video report on what was going on with the church in Afghanistan while he's in Pakistan. And he said, you know, he, he's trying to get as many of them as he can out of the country 
for safety, but he said there was a whole bunch of them that said, no, we're not leaving. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to stand for Jesus mm -hmm. here. Wow. And he was just overwhelmed wow. yeah. at their courage and their strength and their, you know, so they obviously were not living from a temporal perspective. Right. Right. And so the, the, that's what's got to shift, I think, and I know it's got to shift in me, you know, and, you know, we say, uh, you know, we, we'll say, oh, Lord, I just give you my life, except for I don't want to die. <laughs> I give you my life, but no suffering. And so it just doesn't work that way. And we've got to, God, God's got to do it. We've got, we got to be willing to make the shift. So if, you know, it, it's going to cost us something coming up here. It's going to cost something to follow Jesus. It's going to cost something to, to stand up. Yes, there will be victories, uh, you know, just as I'm sure there, I don't know what's going on in Afghanistan, but I'm going to assume that some people are being supernaturally protected. You know, you think of Peter and, uh, is it James that were arrested? Peter and, yeah, Peter and James are arrested. And, uh, you know, it says Herod brought out James and killed him. Okay, that is it, you know. And then it says, but prayer was, and then Peter was next, right? Next day it's going to be Peter. And well, here's the amazing thing. Peter was asleep. You know, he's, the next day I'm going to be killed. He's like, ah. I don't think I'd be sleeping. I'd be like, ah. Why could he do that? Because he was living from a eternal perspective. I always feel sorry for James. It says, and prayer was made for Peter by the church. And I'm thinking, man, nobody liked James. They didn't pray for him. <laughs> so, it was, it was, you know, there was a sacrifice that was made there. Number five, we look at people, this is a big deal, we look at people around us from an eternal perspective, understanding that they are lost and in need to hear the gospel. I'll make, I'm sure you've heard the statement, you probably never made it here, which I'm glad that you probably never made this statement. But I've heard Christians say, uh, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. How many of you ever heard that statement? Okay. Then they'll go, St. Francis of Assisi said that. You know what? He didn't say that. He didn't say that. I, I just cringe when I hear people say that. Because you know what? Nobody's ever got saved by my good works. Nobody's ever got saved by my kindness. Nobody's ever got saved because I gave them five dollars. <laughs> right? Unless I wrote on the five dollars, <clears throat> God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. <clears throat> the gospel is words. The gospel, you know, Romans, 12, uh, Romans chapter 1 I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And then Paul writes later and says, How will they believe whom they have, whom they have never heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they're sent? How beautiful are the feet of him who brings good tidings of great news. Come on. Amen. And so, yes, we, we need to do good works. Titus, Paul writes to Titus and says, Let, make sure the people are rich in good works. Five dollars opens the door. Awesome. Doing something nice opens the door. It, it, you know, doing the act of kindness, even praying for the sick, opens the door. It's the bridge. We say it this way. Love is the bridge over which the gospel travels. So yes, we are to love people. We are to do good. Be rich in good works, but, the, but those works need to be joined with the sharing of Jesus Christ. That's right. Who he is, why he came, that he's risen from the dead. You know, listen, people are even okay with you saying God, just as long as you don't use the name of Jesus. The devil's great with you using God. But if you start talking about Jesus, he's got a problem. And so I believe that, that we have to shift to where I do, I do these, not boasting on myself, but anyway, I'm, on, I'm working on all this stuff myself, but 
Uh, I do this four mile walk around my neighborhood. I just do lap after lap after lap. Finally, the people are like, who's that crazy guy out there? And uh, pray, in, pray in tongues while I'm walking and so on. And uh, shocking, I mean, yesterday, four of my neighbors came out to talk to me. Wow. One lady, uh, wow. it, actually, I, 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 I do a, just a, a cycle, a circle that's like a third of a mile around the thing. And there was a lady that was just getting into her car. She was on crutches. And she was getting into her car, and I thought, man, I should probably, you know, talk to her. And I thought, well, if she's here when I come back around again, I'll do that. Right. So I went a few more laps, and she was coming back from wherever she had went. She was getting out of the car. She almost walked in the door of her house. And I said, hey! I yelled at her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's great. Hey! I said, uh, what happened to your leg? She goes, I have cancer. Oh. She says, I've got, you know, they had to remove part of my femur and blah, 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 blah. And so... Um, uh, I started talking about praying for her and all this stuff, and right away she said, you know what, <laughs> you get this. She, I think she looked like she was in around 40 to 50, somewhere in there. She said, um, th this, this year's been a bad year. Both my parents died and my 29-year-old son died this year. Oh. And when, right as he died, I went to the doctor and they told me I had cancer. Oh my God. Okay? So she then so I started talking to her. She says, "I've been reading my Bible. I've been talking about my brother-in-law does a Bible study. Da da da. da. I invited her to come over to get prayer at the healing room and so on. So I'm going to pray for you and so on. I'll probably make another lap around and catch her again and all that. But you know, so here, here, so I, I believe. Okay, let me end with this. Um, I've been arrested recently with the fact that over and over, Luke." writes in the Gospel of Luke, it says, and power was coming out of Jesus. Power, it say it said it like three times, power was coming out of him, so multitudes were being drawn. And I thought, wait a minute, is that a Jesus only thing, or is that something we're supposed to have? Then I thought about, well, power came out of Peter, they wanted to just get in his shadow. Uh, power came out of Paul, they took handkerchiefs from him, you know, and people were getting delivered and healed. Uh, power came out of Philip when he preached the gospel in Samaria. Amen. And uh, power came out of, who's the third, fourth one? Um, somebody else. Anyhow, oh, Stephen, who was just a, a deacon in the church. So I realized, wait a minute, these guys got a hold of this. They understood how to, and so that's my new prayer. God, I want it so that when I'm walking around people, the power of God is coming out of me. Not because I'm Jesus, but because I'm like Jesus. And because I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that, you know, we have this, uh, we have this, we, uh, you know, if you go to charismatic groups, I'm assuming we're kind of a charismatic group here. <laughs> you know, we're all like, oh, come God, oh, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. Like, I'm already here, I'm already here. <laughs> you know, oh God, we need you. If he's in like you going I'm in here. <laughs> and so again, I've seen God come down as rain out of a cloudless sky. I've seen the Holy Spirit fall on crowds, uh, you know, in different various ways. I actually I one time I was in a prayer meeting for ninety-one consecutive hours, and about the third day there was a visible cloud of the Lord hanging in the room. You know, so I've seen God come in those kind of ways. But let me tell you the primary way that God comes. He comes through you. Where two or more of you are gathered in my name, I'm right there in the middle of it. Why? Because when you come, you bring the Holy Spirit with you. John 7, as it were, uh, those who believe in me, as it were, out of, my innermost, out of their innermost being will flow, what? Rivers of living water. So that's the river of Ezekiel. Right? Where the river flowed, Amen. it flowed out, and it brought healing, it brought wherever it went, it made the waters pure and clear and so on. It's the river in Revelations 21. Here's the river again, the flowing river. But the river is, didn't stop between Ezekiel and Revelations. It's still flowing. It's just flowing through us. Yeah. We're, the we're the ones that release the river. Mm -hmm. So I just, just close with this. Just a suggestion. Walk around your, your neighborhood for Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And, 
and uh, you know, I won't go into it, but I have these encounters. I have, one, I have people come out, walk out in the street, could you come into my house? I'm like, what? Wow. Never seen them before, I don't know who they are. Come into our house. Well, I just believe that if, as we walk and pray, as we get around people, uh, and we just thought, Lord, I just released the river right now. Yes. Rivers of living water. I want to see your power come out of my, this body. Yes. 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 Amen. Yes. Let's all stand. Yes. All right. I think I hammered you enough here. Oh. <laughs> let's make the shift. Yes. Let's cooperate with God and let's shift from being a temporally minded church earthly minded church to be a heavenly mind. I said that statement, by the way, again, I, I wrote that statement down. Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., he was a physician and a poet, who said, some people are so heavenly minded they are no earthly good. By the way, his son was one of the most famous uh, pastors in America for years, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. And uh, um, uh, what I believe is that we have become so earthly minded, we're of no heavenly good. And we need to switch over. And I believe God's going to help us. You know, I believe that He's He's going to finish the good work that He's begun in us, especially here with you guys. You guys are all, you know, mighty saints of God. So, Father, I just want to pray and let's just lift our hands to the Lord right now. Lord, I thank you. We want to shift. You said that in the last days you would pour out your spirit upon all flesh. Sons and daughters would prophesy, old men would dream dreams, young men would see visions. God, we thank you, God, that there, we believe there's a second outpouring that's happening. It's going to pour out in us and through us. And God, we want to make that shift, especially the Christians here in America, God, that we would begin to realize we're seated with you. We're, we're third heaven people. Come on. And you're going to give us third heaven solutions to first heaven problems. And so Lord, I ask you to do that in me and all of us here. We just come and once again present our bodies to you, a living and holy sacrifice. Lord, let us just empty ourselves of ourselves so we can be filled up to God. That Lord, everywhere we go, you would be the overflow, just like our cups. You anointed my head with oil and my cup overflows. Make us overflowing vessels wherever we are, to our neighbors, our family, to our co-workers, wherever you, yeah. you know, our life finds us, that we realize we're on a mission. Well, we don't have to go to Africa or to another country to be on a mission. We're on a mission right now, wherever we live. We're missionaries. And God, we thank you for that. And Lord, we thank you that you lived your entire life from a heavenly perspective. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you so much.